السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين I will praise you to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessing be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. This evening's presentation is on Judgment Day, Heaven and Hell, as has been introduced. This, of course, I'm sure you realize is a massive topic. It involves a lot of information which there is no way that I would be able to present it all within 50 minutes. However, I will be focusing on what is most important about the Judgment Day, about heaven and hell. And at the same time, we will look briefly at some of the events that are related to them. But as a starting point, I would just like to narrate to you a hadith found in Sahih al-Bukhari which a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him Mata sa'ati ya Rasulullah When will the hour be? When will the resurrection come? When will the day of judgment come? And the Prophet's response to Rasulullah to him was Mada a'dad talaha What? Have you prepared for it? This is the essence of what we should reflect on when we think about the Day of Judgment. What have we prepared for it? Because, generally speaking, in the Muslim world today, due to the effects of cultural Islam or folk Islam, on the minds of the masses of Muslims, there is a general attitude that righteousness should be delayed until old age. You delay righteousness until old age. People are encouraged to enjoy their lives, have a good time, you know, and don't worry about it, you are still young. When you get older, this is the time that you now become religious. As such, we find Hajj, this critical pillar of Islam, about which Prophet Muhammad you know, had confirmed to us that it is compulsory on us once one has the means. This is in clarification of Allah's statement in the Quran, you know, where Allah instructs us with regards to Hajj, that it is compulsory on everyone who can find a way there. That way is the means, the ability. Once one has the ability to make Hajj, then one should do so. And Prophet Muhammad has said that if a person has the ability and delays it, that it makes no difference to Allah whether he died as a Christian or a Jew. It is something despicable Islamically to delay the Hajj when one has the means. But, this is the general attitude in the Muslim Ummah today. People are encouraged to delay Hajj. Wait until the latter part of your life. You still got a lot more things to do. You know, you're still young. There's so much, you know, other evil that you're likely to do and, you know, life to enjoy, etc. Don't go and make Hajj now. Because Hajj is supposed to wipe away all your sins. So you want to wait until the latter part of your life, you know, when you have run out of steam. You can't hardly do any more sins, nothing else to do now but ibadah, turn back to Allah, now you go make your Hajj, you know. This is why so many people are dying on the way to Hajj, and, you know, dying in Hajj. And, you know. I mean, it's not a bad thing to die in Hajj, but you see, where people have delayed Hajj to this point, it is a delusion on the part of people thinking that this Hajj is going to purify them. Because a person 
who has lived a life of sin. When he goes to make that Hajj, or she goes to make that Hajj, they will not be able to make the Hajj which Allah has prescribed. The Hajj Mabrur, about which Allah says, لا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. There should be no corruption in our actions, in our speech, argumentation during Hajj. It should not be there. But a person who has lived a corrupt life, who comes to that Hajj situation where people, two million people are crowded together, they cannot maintain themselves. They will become corrupt, they will curse people, person steps on their foot, they're going to try and step back on everybody else's foot, somebody elbows them, they're going to be fighting it. They will not be able to make it to the they will not have the patience. The patience which is built by faith, produced by righteous deeds over a lifetime. They will not be able to do it, where a person has committed themselves to a righteous way and is submitting to Allah. So they will not be able to achieve it. The other attitude that is held related to this is that a person, you know, so we have, we're still young, we still have time. But the issue of time, do we have time? This is the question that one has to really ask oneself. Do we have time? Do we know when we're going to die? No one does. Allah tells us in the Quran, repentance. Because repentance which will purify us, you know, before we die. Allah says very clearly, وَلَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ حَتَّى إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتِ قَالُوا إِنِّي تُبْتُ الْآنِ Repentance will not be accepted from those who continue to do evil until death overtakes them. And they say, we now repent. وَلَا لِلَّذِينَ يَمُوتُونَ وَهُمْ كُفَّارٌ أُولَٰئِكَ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا Nor will it be accepted from those who die in a state of disbelief. I have prepared for them a painful punishment. This is the fourth chapter, verse 18. The point here is that nobody knows when death will overtake us. So we cannot delay righteousness, we cannot delay repentance, whatever sins and corruption we may be involved in now, we cannot put it off for another day or for another hour, we cannot afford to do that. Abdullah ibn Umar quoted Prophet Muhammad as saying that Allah most great and glorious will accept his servant's repentance until the death rattle begins. Once death catches a person, then repentance will not be accepted. And on another occasion, as reported by Abu Huraira in Sahih Muslim, he said, when three signs appear, faith will not benefit anyone who has not previously believed, or has not derived any good from his or her faith. The rising of the sun in the west, the Antichrist and the beast of the earth. So there is a time limit. There is a time limit. And if we delay until we are caught in that circumstance, then repentance will not be acceptable by Allah. Furthermore, Allah has warned us about how He takes people. That He doesn't give you a warning so you can prepare yourself for death. If a person chooses a correct path, a, a corrupt path, then Allah will catch that person when he or she least expects it. In Surah Al-An'am, verse 44, Allah says there, فَلَمَّا نَسَوْا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فتحنا عليهم أبواب كل شيء حتى إذا فرحوا بما أوتوا 
أخذناهم بغتة فإذا هم مبلسون When they forgot what truths they were reminded of I opened the gates of every pleasurable thing for them until in the midst of their enjoyment I suddenly snatched them and they were plunged into destruction full of regret and sorrow This is how Allah takes people There is no chance for repentance when the time for death comes it comes as they say when one would least expect it when a person dies the soul is taken the death is the process of the soul being extracted from the body because the spirit doesn't die it is extracted from the body and that represents death and this is why Sleep is looked at as being the sister of death. Because during sleep, Allah says, that the angels will take the soul. But the connection with the body remains. Those who Allah has destined will die in their sleep, the connection will break. Those whom He has destined will wake, awaken and continue to live, He allows the soul to come back. But for those who die, When the souls were taken, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in extensive hadith have described the process by which the soul is taken. The difference between the believer and the disbeliever. That the believer, the soul is taken, it's like a drop of water from a watered uh, vessel. The drop drops with complete ease. Whereas the disbeliever It is torn out of the body because it doesn't want to leave. It realizes it's all over. And it doesn't want to leave that body. So it is torn out. Like claws scratching through wet wool. That was described. Tearing it into pieces. And in the case of the believer, angels from heaven will come with garments from heaven sweetly scented and wrap the soul and take it up into the heavens. And as it goes through the different heavens, the angels will praise it, ask who this good soul was, and ask Allah to bless the soul before it is returned back to the individual in the state of the grave. And again, I stress the state of the grave, because again, people start to question, well, what about somebody who falls off a ship and sharks eat him up? Where is his grave? What's going on? No, it's in the state of the grave. Not necessarily a location, a physical location, but the state of the grave that the soul enters into. When it crosses, the barzakh goes into the next world. In that state. For the evil soul, two angels will wait for the soul, and they will be evil-looking They will stand a distance away from it and they will bring some rags to wrap it in and it will stink. That soul, soul will be coming out and it will, it will have a stench to it. And it will carry it up towards the heavens but it will not be allowed to go, go into the heavens. It will be cast out and thrown back into the body or the state, back in the state of the grave. There, the deeds of that soul will be personified in the form of another being. Those the righteous souls, the deeds will come as a handsome looking, sweet smelling, you know, young man who will reply when he's asked, who are you? That I am your good deeds and I bring you glad tidings of a good future. Whereas the individual who is evil, cast back into the body, the deed will appear as an ugly, hideous beast. And he will be shocked and asked, asking, you know, what are you? And he will be informed that I am your deed, your evil deed. And this will, of course, bring greater horror and fear over that individual. 
An individual will be questioned in the grave by two angels known as Munkar and Nakir. They will be asked, who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is the prophet who was sent to you? The believers will answer, my Lord is Allah. My religion was Islam. My prophet was Muhammad, sallallahu Or Musa, depending with, with the followers of the prophet, say what? The disbeliever will not be able to answer. Not meaning that the individual will not have that knowledge. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, he will only say, ah, ah, ah. He will want to say it, but it will not come out. So this questioning will be a means of, of further degradation, of lowering that individual, making him feel even more helpless and and uh, in a state of, of abject despair. So don't think that simply because you have your children memorized, Islam Udini, or Quran the story, or Muhammad Nabi, you know, some phrase like this, which you just memorize that, okay kid, you memorize this, so when the questions come in the grave, you'll be able to answer. No, it's not about memorizing. It's not about memorizing. It's no harm to teach the children Allahu Rabbi, or Islam Udini, or Muhammad Nabi. But, they need to know what it means. They need to apply it in their lives. Just merely memorizing these phrases will not do anything for them in the next life. This is very important. Furthermore, that individual, after he has answered the question, the good soul, the believing soul, then a window of paradise will be open and the winds from paradise will come over that individual until the resurrection. For the evil, a window on hell is open and the scorching winds from hell will be roasting him until or her until the time of the resurrection. And it's important to understand this issue of the time of the resurrection in that some people will question what about people who died 10,000 years ago? Are they waiting around in the grave all this time? You know? Same thing, if I die now, you know, what if, uh, you know, Yom al Qiyamah, the resurrection, is not another 10,000 years from now? It means I'll be sitting around in the grave all this time? No. No, this is not how we should perceive of it. When a person dies, it is as if the whole process of resurrection is Begin, begun. From the time you go in, you and, and, and go into that state, you go, your soul travels through this journey, and it's settled in that situation, then the resurrection is going to come for you shortly after that. It's not a, a long extended period of time that, that you, we would perceive in this life with regards to those who died many thousands of years ago. Because when a person dies, he leaves, he or she leaves the time zone. They're no longer governed by time. Time, this is living on this earth, in this world, where the earth spins, you know, there's a day and a night, 24 hours, etc. That's for those living on this earth. When you go to sleep, sometimes you wake up thinking, you know, in your sleep, you're, you did a journey around the whole world. You visited how many countries, etc., etc. And you wake up and you see, oh, you only slept for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Another time, it seems that you just woke up, you closed your eyes, and all of a sudden you're waking back up again. You didn't hardly sleep. You're still very tired. And you look at the watch, wow, you slept for two hours. Because when you enter the state, when the soul is taken, you're out of the time zone. So, we can forget that issue of time. Now, the point which is most significant to us here is that those who have died, there are Muslims around the world who call on some of those who have died, whether they be Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or the so-called saints. They call on them in times of need. They ask them to fulfill their desires, their wishes. 
The fact of the matter is that, as we said earlier, at dua hu al ibadah, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, reported in Abu Dawood, Sunan Abu Dawood, that calling on anyone, supplicating to anyone is worship. This represents a form of worship. And this is calling on others besides Allah. This is shirk. This is not acceptable. One can only call on Allah. Allah tells us in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 194, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ عِبَادٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ Those who you call on besides Allah, call on in prayer, besides Allah, are slaves, like yourselves. They can do nothing. Just read in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 186, Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَيْبٍ And if my slaves ask you about me, I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ I answer the supplications of one who supplicates if he does so, calls on me. This is Allah's promise. So, we have to be very clear. If we are to face Allah in a position, a good position, on Yawm Qiyamah, if we are to come out of this life and enter a state of the grave which is pleasing, which represents the tidings for us and our future, then we have to come out of this world with our hearts purified from calling on others besides Allah. Then, we have a period till the resurrection. That period, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu informed us has minor signs and major signs leading up to it. Among them, those mentioned in Sahih Muslim, that you would see barefoot, naked, poor shepherds competing with each other in the building of tall buildings. Bedouins and the desert, building all these buildings. Also found in Bukhari and Muslim, that among the signs, knowledge will decrease, ignorance will abound, adultery will become widespread, and wine will be drunk. Women will abound, and men will become scarce to the extent that there will be a single provider for 50 women. Furthermore, in another narration found in the Nasai, Prophet Muhammad as reported by Anna said that among the signs, the minor signs, are that people will compete with one another in the building and decorating of masjids. This is something that is happening today. In Morocco, King Hassan built a masjid with a light laser beam that is supposed to link up with Mecca and a huge edifice which he borrowed money from France, Riba, to build this money. This huge edifice. He's building a pyramid like the ancient Egyptians built pyramids leaving it behind the signs of their presence. We find unfortunately Muslims in different parts of the world doing this. The building of masjids is something people compete with each other in. A masjid. What is, the, what is the purpose of the masjid? Is it that we should make it glittering with huge minarets and big dome, etc., etc.? And we only have a few people lining up in it anyway. It only fills up on Eid or Janazah. Is the time when it fills up? Is this, this, is this what was intended? The masjid, the house of worship, it's supposed to be simple. I'm not saying we cannot innovate, meaning that we have to go back and build one like the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, we get a few palm trees, cut them in half, you know, pick up and put some palm fronds on the top and let's go out and pray. No, of course, it's not practical, the weather, etc. You know, we are allowed to use brick, concrete, etc. and build something. But it doesn't have to be the way people are doing it now, squandering huge amounts of money in these buildings. Truly, 
even the issue of a dome and a minaret. The dome, people feel, if you don't put a dome on a masjid, it's not a masjid. Guess what? Prophet Muhammad Sallam's masjid didn't have a dome. So what? He didn't have a masjid. You know, the, the Kaaba, built by Prophet Abraham, rebuilt in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, and confirmed, is there a dome over the Kaaba? No dome. So, the dome was a, a technological advancement of the period of time which had a purpose. There were usually windows around the side which allowed air to come in and circulate, to increase the circulation of air. So, it had a purpose. Now we have central air conditioning, etc., etc. We don't need a dome. If the dome, because in many of these masjids, the dome alone will cost tens of thousands of dollars. This is the fact. Any architect will tell you. It will cost tens of thousands of dollars. It is haram to spend that money that way for something which is not needed. Especially when we see among the signs is that people will be competing in the building and decorating of them. In the minaret. What was the purpose of the minaret? Was there a minaret on the masjid of Prophet Muhammad No. No minaret. Is there a minaret on the Kaaba? No, no minaret. So if our basic examples of masjid don't have minarets, this tells us this is not necessary. Again, people will spend tens of thousands of dollars to put up minarets. And what, what was the purpose of the minarets? The minarets, actually originally it was called Ilmatvena. It's a place where they'd make the Adhan from. They stood on the roof. As the buildings got bigger and taller and more, they built some structure on top of the roof of the masjid so that the person calling the Adhan could go up there. So his Adhan could be heard. And it got taller and taller. Eventually they put a light on it so that people, when the city is very big, they'll be able to spot at night where the mouth it is. Now, in our time, we have uh, amplification system. We don't need a minaret for the Adhan to be heard. Actually, in many of these places, you can't even make the Adhan allowed. Right? Many Western countries, you can't do it. You make an Adhan inside the masjid and that's it. That's so it is definitely a waste of money. And Muslims have to realize that they will be held to account for this. Now amongst the major signs, Hawaifa related on one occasion, this is recorded in Sahih Muslim, that he and some of the companions were sitting in the masjid discussing things and the Prophet Muhammad came and asked them what they were discussing about and they related that they were speaking about the hour and the Prophet said it will not come until you have seen ten times now he's speaking of the major sign the smoke the antichrist the beast the rising of the sun from its place of setting the descent of Jesus, the son of Mary, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, three earthquakes, an earthquake in the east, an earthquake in the west, and an earthquake in the Arabian Peninsula. And the last of those is a fire which will emerge from Yemen, driving people to their place of gathering. Those are the major signs. I said, due to the time saying that we have to work with him, I can't go in and go to elaborate on what these signs are. There are many books available. And I said, most important thing is for us to reflect on the principles that we need to gain from it. At any case, when the righteous souls are taken, because the final hour doesn't come and there are righteous people on the earth. The righteous people will be taken after the time of Prophet Isa, after the destruction of the Antichrist, Righteous people's souls are taken, and only those remaining are the corrupt. Satan will come to them, invite them to worshiping idols, they will begin to worship idols again, and corruption will spread through the land. Allah's name will not anymore be mentioned. At this time, the trumpet will be blown. 
When the trumpet is first blown, the whole world is destroyed. And then the world will be remade, rain will come, and human beings will start to grow up from the earth like vegetables. This is how Prophet Muhammad described it. On a clear plain, the earth no longer has the mountains and things that we saw them before, but we are, people are being resurrected on a clear, flat plain. Then at the second blowing of the trumpet, the people who have been raised up, they will stand, staring. And from this point onwards, of course, they are described as being raised naked and uncircumcised. And everybody will be scared for himself and herself. Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي Everybody is running. You know, a man will run from his brother, his mother and his father. Women will do the same from their sisters, mothers and fathers, etc. Brothers. Nobody will have time. Nobody will have any uh, time to, to, to deal with the problems of anybody else. People will be in a state, a frantic state. And in this state here, of course, as we said, that they're standing naked, uncircumcised, Aisha asked of Muhammad Sallam, we're going to be standing there all naked? Because of course, in Islam, you know, we're supposed to cover ourselves, and now here's this time, everybody's standing to be stark naked. Of Muhammad Sallam said, people will be so scared, nobody will have time to be looking around, you know. In <laughs> no. no yeah, people are just so, just out of their minds with worry, etc. No time to look around. And, People will be perspiring. Prophet ﷺ said they will be perspiring. You know, people who are evil and have a lot of sins behind them, they'll be perspiring so they'll be up in their neck, to their neck in perspiration, you know, drowning in their perspiration. You know, other people, depending on the level of sin, you know, the perspiration will take a certain position relative to their body. Then, people will start running, looking for Adam. They go to Prophet Adam asking his help, intercession for them. You know, to get out of this state on the plane where the sun has come close to them, they're boiling. Adam tells them, no, he can't do it. Go check Prophet Nuh. So they go to Prophet Nuh. He says, no, you know, Allah had given him a, um, a, a dua which would be answered and he used it up, you know, against his people. So he couldn't do anything for them now. And they went to, he said, try Prophet Abraham. They go to Prophet Abraham. He can't do anything. Go to Prophet Moses. He can't do anything. Go to Prophet <coughs> Jesus. He can't do anything. And he's, they're sent to Prophet Muhammad. So I tell them, may Allah's peace and blessing be on all of them. And at this point, Prophet Muhammad will uh, make sujood before Allah. And Allah will have him stay there for a period of time until he allows him to raise his head. And then he tells him, to intercede. And this first intercession is referred to as the great intercession. And it's the intercession which allows people to shift from this state, from this position on the plane, to the next state. And the next state of people is referred to as the period of exposure, as mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah says there, وَعُرِدُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَحْفَىٰ And you will be exposed before your Lord in rows. لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ You will, you have come to us, to Allah, before Allah, as you were created at first. And here, in the first exposure, uh, people will start to blame each other. You know, it was my fault, it was him who did it, and you know, we have different verses in the Quran where people, you know, ask Allah to punish these people, extra punishments, because it's, you know, they're the ones who misguided them, etc. Then there will be a second exposure in which people will just give up, admit to their sins and just start to ask, find excuses asking for Allah's forgiveness. And there's a third exposure. And at the third exposure, their deeds will be distributed among them. Their deeds are given to them in the right hand and in the left hand. Those who are righteous will receive their book of deeds in the right hand and those who are unrighteous will receive it in the left hand. And this principle of, 
of receiving the book of deeds in the right and the left is something that we should reflect on in our daily life. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stressed to us the importance of the right, savoring the right over the left, eating with the right, going into the masjid with your right foot, uh, you know, stepping out of the masjid with your left foot, leaving your right foot in, putting on your shoes, right foot first, you know. Sometimes people in ignorance, not knowing what is the purpose of this, they question, what is this? Islam is so picky that you, you're putting on your shirt, you have to put your right hand first, then your left, and you know, what is this? What does it matter if you jump with both feet in your shoes one time? You know? Or jumped out of the masjid both feet together? You know? What does it matter? Why do you have to get into this? The point is that it is not so much the act. It is what is behind that act. The act is a remembrance for us to remember, to favor the right. That on the day of judgment, those who are going to be righteous will receive their book of deeds in the right hand. So this is a reminder for us to reflect on that. Remembering, of course, Allah has commanded us through His Prophet to choose the right. Put in some organization in our lives. We're not like animals. An animal doesn't think, you know, right foot, left foot, whatever. It just does what it feels like doing, you know. But as human beings, we, we have a mind. We are able to think and to choose to go on a particular path. So, we choose to go on the one which the Prophet Muhammad has described for us as part of an organization of our lives in accordance with his way and also to remind us of that day the day of judgment. And having been exposed with the deeds being given in the right and the left, questions come. The questioning begins. It is mentioned in Tirmidhi that you will be asked about La ilaha illallah, a declaration of faith. What was it? Was it sincere? Was it acted upon? We'll have to answer the second major area to be asked, actually, uh, in another narration, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's the first thing we'll be asked about, is Salah. And he said, this is in Tirmidhi, if the Salah is in order, then you will have prospered and succeeded. But if it is impaired, then you have failed and you're in a state of ruin. Meaning, that it is not like exams in school. You know, you have mathematics, you have English, you have, you know, geography, you have different subjects. Now, you can fail one or two subjects, as long as you pass the other ones, you know, if you fail one or two, it's okay. You can still move on, you got makeup exams, all these other kinds of things. It's not like that. If you're questioned, if we're questioned about Salah, and we fail that question, then everything else is failed. This is why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, Al-Ahd al-Ladhi baynana wa baynahumu salah Faman tarakahu faqad tah That the distinction between the believers and disbelievers is salah. Whoever abandons it has become a disbeliever. That's why he said that. Because on that day, if a person's salah is not in accordance with how it was prescribed, then they have failed. They have failed the whole program. Meaning, Friday Muslims, Ramadan Muslims, watch out for that day. Watch out for that day. Because Islam was not prescribed on Friday or Ramadan. Salah was not prescribed for Friday and Ramadan. It was prescribed five times a day. And anything less than that is failure. If one abandons the prayer, then, as the Prophet said, one enters into a state of disbelief. Of course, you can repent, correct yourself, get out of it. But if you don't, then you're under that warning, that curse as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said. We'll be asked about those under our care. As Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, quu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. 
or you believe protects yourself and your family from the hellfire. We have a responsibility, those of us in positions over family members, to try to protect them. And we'll be asked about them. We'll be asked about our bodily organs, our hearing, our sight, and our heart will be questioned. وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمُ إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَطَرَ وَالْفُعَادَ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْئُولًا Do not follow that which you have no knowledge of. Your hearing, sight and heart will be questioned. You will be questioned about all of them. You will be questioned about all of them. Allah begins with saying, do not follow that which you have no knowledge of. وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ This is a warning away from blind following. What you have no knowledge of. You're just blindly following it. The people in our village did it that way. The people in our country did it that way. My family has always done it this way. We Hanafis do it this way. You have no knowledge. Just words. These are words that you've memorized. You heard your parents say it, and your grandparents used to say the same thing whenever questions are, oh, we are, whatever. This is ignorance. And for us to follow that, we will be asked on the Day of Judgment. Our hearing, what we heard when people told us, Allah and His Messenger said so and so, and we said, حَسْبُنَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَائِنَا It was enough for us what we found our parents, four parents doing. What our eyes have seen when books have come to us, and material has been made available to us. We've seen the truth, but we prefer to go with our culture and our heart. Our heart will be asked because we will know inside ourselves that we were following something in ignorance and the truth was elsewhere but we didn't have a desire to follow it. So we will be asked, our bodily parts will be asked and they will give witness against us on that day of judgment. Allah talks elsewhere where he says and people will be asked, why are you doing this? Why the, the, the body parts are speaking against? They will say, Allah who made everything speak has made us speak and they're going to give witness against us. And we'll be asked about what ple- whatever pleasures Allah gives us in this world. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ عَنِ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ We'll be asked about all of the pleasurable things, pleasurable things which Allah has given us. And in the course of the reckoning here, and the questions, there are some statements that Prophet Muhammad has made which we should reflect on as it gives us a better clarity about our situation on that day. On one occasion he asked his companions, do you know who is truly bankrupt? You know what a bankrupt person is? And they said, as far as we know, it's a person who has no dirhams or dinars. And he said, no. The truly bankrupt person is the one who comes before Allah with a scale of good deeds. Heavy. They think they're okay. You know? What a great scholar. And one of the signs of it that certain scholars, they have a special robe, garment, you know, like the priests of the, uh, the um, Catholics and that, you know, they have special robes and garments, and you see them, that's the priest, the bishop, everybody. You have Muslims who now have a garb, special scholars, they have the special garb, and you know, once you see, you say, oh, he's a scholar, and so on, so on, so on. Islam, we have no uniforms. We have no holy gods. You know, humility is an essential part of scholarship. 
took his collar. When you question him, you ask him, should I do this or not? He says no. And you say, well, now, what is the evidence? Who are you to ask me? If I told you, you wouldn't understand anyway. Yeah. Unfortunate. Such a scholar, those who have this kind of attitude, who, who gains knowledge, not for the sake of helping others, guiding them, helping themselves, but so that they can be the scholar. Maulana. Everybody has to come to them. They're in it for the dunya. It provides a means, it gives them authority, etc., etc. Such, Allah will say, well, the people praise you. They cheered you. And there's nothing for you in this life. You will be dragged away on his face, thrown in the hellfire. And the third, will be a philanthropist. One who spends his money here, there, and everywhere. He said, be that, supposedly. Allah will ask him, what did you do with the money? He said, that's what I did. He said, be I built this, I gave here, or there. Allah will say, no. He did it so that people would say, what a generous person this is. How kind, how generous, how noble. People have said it. Nothing for you. In the next life, you'll be dragged away on his face and thrown in the hellfire. In this state also, in the course of the questioning, prior to the actual asking of the final questions, Prophet in a narration related by Sahal ibn Sa'ad, said that he will go by a pond, al Khawd. And he said that whoever passes by me will drink and he will never again be thirsty. A group of people will come to me whom I recognize and who will recognize me. Then they will be veiled from me. A veil will come up between me and them. And I will say, they are from among my followers, my ummah. And it will be said to him, indeed, you didn't know or you don't know what innovations they made after your time. So I will say, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, I will say, be off, be off, get away to whoever changed the religion after me. These are people who will recognize the Prophet and he will recognize them. They will be among those who who are classified in the general sense amongst the followers from the Ummah. But due to their innovations in the religion, due to the changes which they made in the religion, they will not be able to avail themselves of the pond of the Prophet from Allah and Sallam. These are all warnings for us to reflect on as we consider the judgment. And the judgment, in the course of the judgment, there is another narration found in Sahih Muslim in which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said that the nations of the, the prophets were exposed to him and he saw some prophets with only one or two people or the family members with them. No one else had believed in them. Then he saw a huge crowd and thought that it was his Ummah. Angel Gabriel told him that this was actually the Ummah of Prophet Musa salam. But he pointed out to him an even larger crowd which stretched across the horizon, from one horizon to the other, and told him, this is your Ummah. And he said, and with them were 70,000 who will enter paradise without reckoning or punishment. There will be those who do not use charms, nor seek them from others, the charms and the amulets, ta'weezes, 
you know, it's installed in India and Pakistan. Hijab, as they call it in Sudan and other places. These things which people wear, rings with numbers and lines and X's and O's and calling on the jinns and all this kind of stuff, Naqsh, Dawood and all, all kinds of weird things. All of this is shirk. If we want a chance of entering paradise without reckoning, then this cannot be a part of our life. Nor do they interpret omens, good luck and bad luck, because of this or that. A mirror breaks in your home, you think you have seven years bad luck coming. Spilling salt. You know, different societies, black cat walking across your path, and all these signs of bad luck. You find a four-leaf clover, you know. The different societies have a different variety of different things which indicate good luck and bad luck. All of these will cause us to be judged. Punishment and reckoning will be before us if we don't purify ourselves of these things. Instead, we should rely on our Lord. These are the ones who will escape the reckoning. Also included with them will be the martyrs, I mean those who are not caught in that process uh, due to Ria, or those who are not held back due to death. The balance, the scales will be raised, the bridge will be over hell, and those who pass over it will pass over according to the level of their faith. Where their faith is strong, they shoot over it, like the speed of light. Where their faith is weak, they're crawling over it. Where their faith is lacking, etc., then they will fall off. Or claws will draw them off. And then those who make it to the other side will enter paradise. The purpose of this bridge, the balance, the judgment, all of this is a demonstration of Allah's justice. Those who do good in this life will receive good in the next. Those who did not will be accordingly punished. Allah has given us an intellect to be able to understand and to reflect. And it is our responsibility to prepare for the judgment. That separation begins here and now. Those of us whose minds are not made up, I ask Allah to help you not walk out of this hall without making up your mind to change your life, to get on the right path, to prepare yourself for death and the judgment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Well, we have uh, many more questions. A few days ago, a young girl was killed by flying debris after a failed explosion went wrong. She was only 12 years old. What is her destiny, heaven or hell? Considering she wasn't a believer. Actually, this was dealt with, this issue was dealt with in an earlier session where we pointed out that as Prophet Muhammad Sallam informed us, <clears throat> for people who were either in circumstances where they had no access to revelation, to the teachings of the Prophet, either directly or indirectly, those who had died at a young age, those who were insane, these people on the resurrection, at the time of the resurrection, they will be resurrected and the Prophet sent to them. 
and that prophet will give them certain instructions, and at that time, if they obey and follow the prophet, then they will be among those going to paradise. If they don't, then they will be amongst those going to hell. So no punishment will be put on anyone to whom a prophet was not sent, as Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا And he would not punish anyone until a messenger was sent to them. Why is punishment, hellfire, so often mentioned in the Quran and in Islam? So people are intelligent enough to live in peace and try to act well without fear of burning in a medieval hellfire. Well, I don't know if the hellfire is medieval, but uh, the issue of uh, the hellfire, this is a part of Allah's creation, as is paradise. It is mentioned in the Quran, as paradise is mentioned. A person in this life, if there is no punishment for one's acts, then there is no drive for the individual to do righteousness and to be good. Punishment, in general, in every society, maintains a certain level of goodness in the society. That legal system is set up for that purpose. If people could function without it, then it wouldn't be there. No society has managed to function without it. So the issue of punishment is based on our natures. We institute punishment in our society to ensure that society runs at least to some degree at a good level in which the rights of people are protected and justice is established to the degree that the laws are applied fairly. So, yes, though some people, a few, would be righteous even if there was no punishment in the hellfire, the vast majority of people do need to be aware of that punishment as an incentive for them to avoid the displeasure of God to avoid corruption and wrong. And paradise is there on the other end as an encouragement and a reward, as a reward for them. When they live lives that are righteous and don't seem to receive the rewards in this life. But a person strives and finds difficulty, those who are involved in corruption seem to have an easy life and seem to be successful, etc. The reward of paradise is there as an incentive for the individual also to stick with what is right and what is good in spite of the difficulties they may face in this life. You mentioned that of the great signs, the fire will lead people to the place of gathering. Where is this place of gathering? Is it also the mahshar? So this is what it is also referred to in the Quran. Uh, the exact location, I am not at liberty to say. But it is on earth. But the earth will not be as we know it in our time. What will be the common age or physical condition of the people of the hereafter? Those in paradise will be at the prime of their youth. Those in hell, Prophet Muhammad has described that their sizes would be increased massively, which would increase the portion, the, the punishment that they would receive, the punishment which involves burning, burning of skin and burning of bodies, etc. The more skin, the bigger you are, you know, the more suffering that you will go through. So their sizes will be increased, you know, massively. What is the punishment of the grave? Uh, this was 
that state that we spoke about where the person after the questions seeing the evil deeds that they would remain with the window on the hellfire open with the scorching wind from the hellfire pouring over them until the resurrection that is the punishment of the grave and along with it there would be other uh, trials that would come to them uh, where the Prophet ﷺ described that the grave or that state would become so constricted that their ribs would you know cross into each other and you know they would be also beaten those evil particularly evil ones among them they would also suffer other punishments in that state what happens to the angels do they go to heaven or hell they don't go to either heaven or hell they become dust so Allah on the day of judgment will resurrect some of the animals uh, among them the Prophet ﷺ described a goat that knocked another, another goat off the mountain you know as was an example that on that day they would be resurrected and the other goat would knock the other one back you know so this is, a, this is a, an example of the fulfillment of Allah's justice you know no wrong or no harm will go on uh, unresolved that there would, there would be that retribution for everything which took place in this life furthermore uh, as the Prophet ﷺ described that death will be personified as a white lamb and brought forth and people from hell and people from heaven will be asked what it is and they both will recognize it as being death and it will be slaughtered and it will be stated that their life will be eternal from there on in there will be no death is it possible to prove scientifically that there is life after death? no I know people have uh, tried to offer some arguments but it's it's not something which can be proven scientifically we cannot prove scientifically there is uh, heaven and hell meaning that you can it's not subject to a microscope you cannot you know do chemical experiments etc and, and prove it and establish it it is something which the prophets have informed us about our intelligence indicates and for those who utilize that intelligence and make use use the revelation to come then they benefit those who don't then they are the ones that have lost and if we were to put it from the point of view of a gamble because gambling is quite popular these days I see you have a crown casino here in uh, Melbourne and the lotto etc is everywhere people like to gamble so we can put it from a point of a gamble if a person believes that there is life after death and does and lives a good life a righteous life and there is no life after death they didn't lose anything but if there is a life after death then they have succeeded but if a person doesn't believe in the life after death and there is a life after death then they've lost everything if there's no life after death okay they didn't they were right they didn't lose anything they didn't gain anything in that sense but if there is no life after death then they are in a major state of loss you mentioned Sahih Muslim and Sahih Al-Bukhari my sheikh says I should not read these books because they are for the ulama the scholars they say I should just read Fabaili Amal Tablighi Nisab is this okay? well Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, these collections of hadith were not made for the scholars. They were collected for the Ummah. These are the statements, the actions of Prophet Muhammad. And it is the duty 
of every Muslim who has the opportunity to read these books, to read and expand their knowledge about the life and the way of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The scholars will help them in that, in the understanding, meaning that you don't pick up the book and anything you read, all of a sudden you go running off, you know, behind this thing, well look what I found. No, you, you need to check it out. Of course, you have scholars who will clarify for you, is this something, because it may be something abrogated, you know, which was a practice in early Islam which was later abrogated. So there does need to be guidance in its usage. But in terms of general reading and expanding one's knowledge, I mean, there's so much in there in terms of, of, uh, of character, you know, of uh, practices, daily practices, general practices, etc. That for one to say, you shouldn't read it, this is not really the best advice. Now, in terms of the books, Fadaili Amal and Tablighi Nisab, and these are collections of hadith from the various books. Uh, in there, there are a number of weak hadiths in these books. So, these books are, in fact, not as safe as Bukhari and Muslim, in that the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim are certified authentic by the scholars of the Muslim world from many centuries until now. Uh, these are the books. They have authentic material, they have useful material in there, but there are also some errors in there, some uh, weak hadith or fabricated hadith, stories which are fantabulous, you know, like the story I remember reading about um, this individual, I don't want to mention any names, but this, this uh, saintly individual of the past who used to pray Salat al-Fajr with the wudu of Isha for like 20 years. Now, I see, this is, this is held up as being something, you know, which should be striven for. To pray Salat al-Fajr with the wudu of Salat al-Isha for 20 odd years. Now, what does this mean? It means you didn't go to sleep at night. That's what it means. Because once you go to sleep, wudu is broken. So it means that this person stayed up in prayer for 20 years of his life. Now, we have a very good example in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which some people came to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked them about his ibadah, his worship. And they described it to them. Then they said, well, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, Allah has forgiven his sins, past and future, present. So, you know, maybe he doesn't have to do as much as we do. So we need to do really a lot more. So one of them said, listen, I'm not going to get married. Another one said that I'm going to fast every day. And the third one said, I'm going to stay up in prayer every night. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallam, when he came, he heard them, he called them, and he said, listen, I'm the best of you. And I fast, and I break fast. I marry women, and I pray at night, and I sleep. And whoever likes a sunnah, or prefers a sunnah way, other than my way, is not a true follower of mine. For men rahiba and sunnati falaysa minni. So, staying awake with the wudu of Isha to pray Fajr is not a commendable action. If Prophet Muhammad rejected it, it is something which he said he didn't do, and he told people who did it that this is wrong, then this is not something commendable. So, I understand that to say that there is information in those books, you know, which does require reliable scholars to check out and clarify, you know, before one tries to implement them. I remember also reading in another one of those books also, where it mentioned that uh, the, the height of the Qur'an, I think it said the height of the Qur'an was Yasin, and the height of Yasin was the Bismillah, and the height of the Bismillah was the Ba, and the height of the Ba was the Ba, the Ba and the Ba. You know. I, I don't really know what this is implying here. I, mean, I don't really know what this is implying. I mean, this is not something said by Rasulullah you know. I mean, if we think we can write a dot and think we have now written the heart of the Quran, you know, this is delusion. 
What kind of ta'weez is haram? The ta'weez or ta'weez amulet wherein general scholars hold that wherein the, the contents are unintelligible in other languages or that are, you know, writing Quran backwards and using, uh, you know, squares and X's and O's and these type of things, this is all considered to be haram, clearly. With regards to Quran, where a person wears a verse of the Quran, some scholars I mentioned earlier amongst the Tabi'un had okayed it, but the vast majority of the Sahaba and the scholars of the Tabi'un rejected it. And the text of the Sunnah, which refers to the hanging of amulets, don't make any distinction between that which has Qur'an or that which didn't. It just spoke of hanging of amulets as being shirk, as being a source of dependency. People will depend on it, and then depending on it, they're falling into shirk. Are there any distinctions among the heavens? How to get the best? Well, Prophet Sallallahu has said whenever we ask for paradise, you know, we should ask for al firdaw the highest point in paradise. And there are seven levels, as there are levels in hell. The more righteous will be on the higher levels, the less righteous will be on the lower levels. But even the person, the last person who will be going, who will go to, will go to paradise, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I said in the narration from the Sahih Muslim that this person who will be the last one coming out of hell, going into paradise, you know, will be told to go, he will crawl out, and be told to go to paradise, and he will go there and he finds it full. And he will come back and he said, Oh Allah, I found it full. And Allah will say, No, no. Go ahead. He said, he said Oh Allah, are you making fun of me? Are you ridiculing, ridiculing me? No. And Allah will tell him no. And allow this person to go and he said, no, there is a place for you which is ten times the size of this world. So that even that person who is going in, where it appears to be full, and he's the last one, you know, even at that level, he will have a place some ten times the size of this whole world. In hell, as you said, there are also levels. The lower levels represent the ones of greatest punishment. Allah tells us in the Quran, in al munafiqina fi darqi al min al-nar, that the hypocrites, those who pretend to be Muslims in this life, will be in the lowest levels of the hellfire. The hypocrite. And hypocrisy. It is something that we all should fear. Especially when Prophet Muhammad had said that there are some people who will do the deeds of the people of paradise throughout their lives, until they reach a bow's length away from paradise and they will start doing the deeds of the people of hell, die doing those deeds and be thrown in hell because of it. Who are these people? These are the hypocrites. These are the people who do the deeds of the people of paradise because their family says pray, fast, they fast, they pray. They are in a community which is keeping an eye on them, so they throw the line. Eventually they get a chance to get out of it, get out of that situation, to go to another town or to leave home, go elsewhere, and you see them partying, taking drugs, fornication, everything. Their true belief will come out. On the other hand, Prophet Muhammad said that there will be some people who will do the deeds of the people of hell throughout their lives until they reach a point where they are only a bow's length away from hell then they will start doing the deeds of the people of paradise, die doing those deeds and be put in paradise. Now, some people may say, okay, that means it's okay, we can keep on doing these deeds, you know. It's all right, we can still have a good time, it's a good chance, you know, things will turn around. No. This is not in reference to those people who know the truth and choose to do evil. 
It's not in reference to them. It's in reference to people who were not exposed to the truth. So they lived lives, which were, you would say, the life of the people of hell. They were Christian, they were Buddhist, they were whatever. You said, they're going to hell. All the Buddhists, all the Christians, they're going to hell. But they were sincere. So Allah gives them an opportunity in their lives to find the truth, and then they change and do the deeds of the people of paradise, they become true believers, and go to paradise because of it. So, the hellfire has many levels. Seven, to be specific. And the lowest, we said, was reserved for the hypocrites. The highest level, which is the lightest punishment, Prophet said that the person who will have that lightest punishment will be Abu Talib. Abu Talib, his uncle, who looked after him, raised him, protected him against the Quraysh. Knew he was a prophet, supported him, but when he came to his deathbed, he chose to go with the way of the forefathers. He chose not to shame his family of pagans, and he chose not to declare his faith. So he died a pagan. Prophet Muhammad said, he will have sandals of fire. He's on the highest level. Only his feet are in the fire, just in those sandals. But the sandals will be enough, the fire of those sandals will be enough that his brains will boil perpetually. And the Prophet ﷺ said that he will perceive that there is no one in the hellfire suffering more punishment than him, though he is receiving the lightest punishment. What is the punishment of a person who commits suicide in rape? Will he be forgiven? I'm not sure what suicide and rape means. I mean, is it suicide and rape? They commit rape and then they commit suicide? Or they were raped and then they committed suicide? Which one? <laughs> A person who was raped, who committed suicide. Well, technically speaking, a person who commits suicide, according to Prophet Muhammad Sallam, will be in the hellfire perpetually, killing themselves over and over again in the way in which they kill themselves in this life. However, for those people who might have done it out of ignorance, meaning that the information did not come to them, and uh, they did this, but the rest of their life in terms of righteousness, etc., is there, then it is possible for Allah to forgive them for it and take them out of that situation. Because Allah can forgive any sin that a person commits as, uh, with, and dies without repentance, except for shirk. So, it is conceivable that that person may be forgiven based on other deeds, etc. Will anyone die in the next world? We said that death will be slaughtered, there will be no death. What happens, what's going to happen when Dajjal comes? What will he do? Who is he? That's a big story. We try to answer all of that, as I said, we try to leave out some of these details because of the fact that, you know, to do it would mean we would not be able to get to anybody's questions. But Dajjal, suffice to say, is known as the Antichrist, will be a, the major uh, figure to claim that he is a prophet, eventually claiming that he is God himself. Uh, he will be doing certain things which, are, which we might consider to be miraculous. The treasures of the earth will come out behind him and follow him. He will fire an arrow into the air and it will come back with blood on it and he will say he killed God, you know. And then a variety of things and people will follow him. 
He will come to, he will enter all cities of the earth with the exception of Mecca and Medina. But when he comes to the outside of, outside of Medina, uh, some 60,000 of its inhabitants will come out and join him. He will create, you know, he will practice, he will kill many, many believers during his period of reign on the earth. Eventually Prophet Isa will come and uh, fight against him. When he sees Prophet Isa, as described in the Hadith, he will crumble like salt and Prophet Isa will go and kill him. And will kill all of his followers. الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصدق The Islamic Information and Support Center of Australia the non-profit charitable organization dedicated to calling people to the pure teachings of Islam, as well as offering support for needy Muslims. If there are 15 different nationalities represented in our town, it is no wonder that people are increasingly adopting Iska as a very Islamic people. We provide classes for males and females on Islamic topics, conduct regular sporting activities, have regular outings in city streets where we call people to Islam for distribution of pamphlets. We have set up a 24 hour information hotline. We continually organize scholarly lecture tours and we print free information booklets and pamphlets on many Islamic topics. So isn't it time for you to make ISCA your dollar center?